Welcome in, everyone, and thank you for listening to the 225th ever episode of the Missouri Sports Podcast, brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the Revel Advertising Studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing great, Cameron. How about you? I'm doing well. We're right back with another episode because uh, it's Christmas season, holiday season, people are traveling, and by people, I mean Kyle is (laughs) traveling, so... Um, we had to, you know, talk about the bowl game still, bragging rights, beginning of SEC basketball play. So we're just going to record this before the holidays. There'll be a little gap before we rejoin everyone post Christmas, post New Year, and then we'll uh, get back into it. So this will be the last episode of 2022. Wow. What a year it's been. 2023 already right around the corner that feels like feels like we're in the future mm. what do you mean like the, we, the number 20 oh, okay 2023 wow that feels like something yeah but then you look around it's like no same old same. yeah <laughs> same not future okay i think um, like the 70s or like 50 years ago yeah it's kind of weird it's insane yeah um, yeah, we're going to talk about the UCF game. Big finish. Mm-hmm. That was fun. Uh, Illinois, Kentucky, and then the bowl game, Gasparilla. We're playing Wake Forest. Uh, before we get into all of that, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, leave us a review, support us on Patreon, all that stuff. Missouri Sports Pod. I mean, patreon.com slash Missouri Sports Pod. Where are you traveling for the holidays? I'm going to New York City for oh, wow. about 10 days. Um, seen some family up there. I've been up there once, but um, not during Christmas time. So my my wife kind of grew up going to New York City for Christmas, and so she's been really excited to, to go back for a few years now. So she finally gets her wish. Nice New York City for Christmas. Oh yeah. Um, home Alone. Mm, yep. Home Alone Two: Lost in New York. Yeah. Well, hopefully we don't lose anybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But can, if we do, I'll start filming just go to the go to the christmas tree Mm -hmm. that's where you'll find it meet meet up at the christmas tree there you (laughs) go make a make a safety plan yeah um kyle let's get into it with this uh ucf basketball game um how do you want to do this should we just talk about this the the finish first because it's just incredible i I can't wait yeah to talk about it i mean uh at this, I mean, that's so unique of a, of a finish at this point. Like we just, I feel like we haven't seen very many of those like positive yes. like, game winners where yes. I, no matter what happens the rest of the year, I feel like, uh, Dre Golston is like pretty much etched his name in like Mizzou lore at this point because of that single handedly what he did in that game. Yes. Yes. A buzzer beater to win the game, nearly half court banks it in. Yeah. Uh, UCF had just made a three to put them up 66, 65 with under a minute left. Golston actually, uh, on the next possession for Mizzou, gets called an offensive foul. Basically, turns the ball over, going the other way, and uh, UCF misses. They take a three, which is like going to seal the game. They yeah. go up by four, and there. they've been making them right, right up so to that point. They miss the three. Hodge gets the rebound with like six seconds left. It's a scramble down to the other end of the floor. No timeout. No timeout uh, from the coaching staff. Love to see it, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, he. Hodge dribbles down, gets fouled, but they don't call it. Travels, but they don't call it. <laughs> Basically rolls the ball over to Golston, like 10 feet behind the three-point line. And he banks it in at yeah. the buzzer. Mizzou wins. It was beautiful. It was it, just beautiful chaos. Yes. Like, yeah, I, I love the no timeout. Just let the athletes do their thing. They're, let them be in the moment. They know they got to hurry. They probably don't even know how much time they have. They just know that. Because Golston probably had another second, but yeah. he just – I mean, he did exactly what he needed to do. But yeah, the the buzzer still went off when the ball was in the air. Okay, like, so it was still pretty close. Yeah, it was just like right before it banked in. Yeah, uh, it, it there are those moments sometimes where they like th- heave it from half court or like shoot yeah. wait and then like the ball bounces around a few times and then the buzzer goes off. You're yeah. like, okay, we need to have a little bit better a little awareness. There. Yeah, but that was fantastic. Yeah, um, that was awesome. I showed uh, Emily the replay of the final minute there, mm-hmm. and she said, and I quote, wow, that's like the best thing to ever happen to Mizzou. 
<laughs> I feel like the sentiment is the same with my wife. It's just like, oh, she's like walking through the living room and I'm in a horrible mood about like watching Mizzou lose. She's like, oh, Mizzou losing again. Yep. Okay. Yep. See you later. <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty much how it goes. Like, why are you a fan of this team? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, but yesterday was great. Yes. Now, it was a little iffy there for a minute. I mean, like right, right there until the end. Yeah, it, it was, there was almost not enough time. Like that was the, I don't know. I still get a little nervous thinking that that's the strategy at the end because it is chaotic and everything, but it worked out this time. Just play defense and what, what do you mean by that exactly? Um, not taking the time out after yeah. the rebound. Okay. It, I, I do think it's the right call, but man, the, the difference, like two, like if there's only four seconds on the clock when Hodge gets the ball. You might have to call timeout, yeah. 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 It was, it was kind of a frenzy there. It was just like all too familiar feeling of like, okay, we've played a pretty good game. Honestly, I didn't expect us to win this game. We're up by double digits in the second half. Oh my gosh, we're going to win this game. Uh, never mind. Uh, here comes this barrage of like a comeback from the other team. And it was like they could not miss at the end of the game, of course. Yeah. Uh, at UCF made three or four threes in a row. It felt like they were just drilling them there right at the end. And it was like, well, we just lose the lead right there with 30 seconds left or whatever it was. And um, But usually uh, that happy ending does not normally happen. Yeah, uh, UCF closed out the game. In their last eight possessions, they had five made threes. And that put them right back in it and then on top for a second. Man, I mean, it's like, I know our perimeter defense is bad. That's obviously, that's that's been a, a problem in basically every game we played all year. So clearly that's uh that's a common theme that we need to work on the perimeter defense but you know just even if you've got open shot doesn't mean they're going to go in like you know the, the team has to still make the shot yeah and it just feels like teams make shots yeah. against us and i don't know like what it is but i mean they're not well defended but they're also it just seems like the teams we're playing are, are shooting well um to take it to rewind a little bit back to the beginning we did have a new starting lineup in this game for the first time so uh, Trey Gomillion was in the starting lineup, but only played 10 minutes. Um, bumped Golston to the bench, and then Ronnie DeGray got the start in in place of Noah Carter. And let's he see. He played quite a bit. Yeah, I'm looking up uh, his minutes right now. 28 minutes for Ronnie DeGray. Mm. And uh, I thought he played pretty well. Uh, obviously, they're trying to find somebody that can play some uh, interior defense and rebound. Yeah. And I think he did that pretty well yeah he, he's gonna have a role all season just doing exactly what he did just kind of doing the dirty work that no one wants to do go up get the the tough rebounds you know block out and um, just kind of throw around downside uh, down low a little bit because we've seen Noah Carter and not being been great Diara's not really seen much play with, although he did get in in this game uh, two minutes yeah Kobe Brown's defense has been a little suspect so Ronnie DeGray is kind of doing what nobody else could do uh, yesterday against a team with a lot more size than we had yeah I feel like he honestly he took more minutes from Aiden Shaw than anybody else Aiden yeah. Shaw only played three minutes yeah that was that was a little bit interesting especially after I thought Shaw played pretty well against Kansas all things yeah. considered um but yeah, you know, down the stretch, especially DeGray, he, he started, like you said, he also finished the game and he had some really clutch um, defensive plays, had a steal, made some clutch free throws right there at the end. So I don't, I don't think Missouri wins that game without Ronnie DeGray doing what he does. Yeah. Um, DeAndre Golston coming off the bench and then was scoreless until the second half, but he had all 16 of his points in the second half. Yeah. I kind of just think that's, that's Dre Golston's game at this point. Like he's kind of streaky. It does kind of feel like he's just forcing it a little bit sometimes, but he's a good athlete. And, um, you know, when he gets it going, he's, he's really effective and kind of put the team on his back there at the end, at least scoring wise. Yeah. And he's got like craftiness to, you know, make a pump fake, up and under move in the lane to score mm -hmm. and we saw a little bit of that too we saw him make Some a couple threes yeah yeah so he really showed it all in the second half and i really i've been kind of wanting to see a different role for him honestly i feel like when he was starting and they were kind of trying to run the offense through him early it just wasn't working yeah and so i feel like um credit to coach gates for switching things up a little bit and he mentioned uh, when UCF got out to a 10-0 start, he was thinking, like, uh, I should not have messed with the starting lineup. But then I think it worked out with uh, 
kind of Golston being that spark plug off the bench to keep the offense going in the second half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am a little bit curious about what Gomillion's role is going to be the rest of the year. I think he's he's struggled at times this year. I think I, I think we all know that he, he brings energy and you know toughness and he plays hard all the time. But you know, I just think it's tough to get him out there when when you've got DeGray or Shaw or or you know Noah Carter, Golston. All of those guys can play a similar role, probably as good or better than what you're getting from go million right now and so i just wonder you know it, it was curious to see him start and then not play very much yeah yeah um mosley did get in the game first time in a few games um only played 10 minutes uh, missed the he, he took four shots missed all four of them mm -hmm. but had four assists yeah and you know he came in at kind of a pivotal point in the game where we were it felt like things were already slipping away there at the beginning it did feel like the offense was running more that it was functioning a lot better with him in there i think he was just kind of helping the ball move around with facilitating with assists and stuff and yeah like you said he didn't score maybe forced a couple shots but that's that's his game that's he's always going to do that but um definitely draws the defensive attention and was taking advantage of that and got some some assists and the guy that uh really kept missouri or like helped missouri get back in the game early was nick honor oh man um he made five threes on the game i think maybe all of them were in the first half yeah like all of them were in the first like six minutes of the game yeah he's kind of has that um like drew smith energy a little bit yeah. where it's like i'm not gonna score much but when i want to i will yeah. like it's like i i can just drop 15 points in yeah. five minutes if i want to <laughs> but i just would i guess normally we'll just facilitate the offense and run the offense so He's clearly got got that ability in his back pocket. If we if we need a clutch basket, Nick Honor's very capable. Now shooting forty seven percent from three on the season. Wow. Um, let me see here. Uh, yeah, Nick Honor kept us in it. Mizzou went on an eighteen to one run in the second half, and then uh, UCF kind of just stayed with it, battled yeah. back, and interestingly, they Missouri won this game at UCF's pace. Uh, mm -hmm. This game only had 63 possessions. Let me look. Yeah, 63 possessions. That is by far the fewest of any Mizzou game this year. The previous low was against Penn at 70 possessions. Yeah. Yeah, there's blatantly great things uh, like that. Missouri winning at UCF's tempo. This is probably gonna be a quadrant to win when it's all said and done on a, on a neutral court. There were, like, some, even though they won, it's like you just take the win however you get it, I guess. But I am pretty concerned about how they scored in this game, how Missouri scored almost completely on three pointers um, and, and free throws. Like, very few two point baskets in this game. I don't know the exact numbers, but I mean, I, I feel like probably 70% or more of their, of their points came on three pointers. 10 makes from two. 13 makes from three yeah that's to me i don't know that that's a, that's sustainable um and missouri's not going to shoot that well every game because we've i feel like that's probably one of their better shooting games in the year probably 52 percent from three yeah you're just not going to keep doing that so that i'm concerned about that but the defense was if those was numbers better. can can just balance out a little bit yeah if we can get the rim scoring you know the two point percentage up in some of these games against good opponents then you don't have to shoot lights out from three, but right. that's what was needed in this game. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, th they weren't, they were not gonna, and maybe it's just because UCF had the massive size advantage. Or maybe it was just all that going on, and so they basically just kind of had no other choice but to just launch launch threes, and uh, it ended up working out. Yeah, it does make me nervous uh, for the future. But okay, so since we're talking about two point scoring, I I want to I did I was looking into this a little bit. But right now, Missouri's offense is still second in the country at 61% shooting from two. Now, that is highly inflated because of games like, let All me those, just click uh, on one. Transition layups? Yeah. So like against Mississippi Valley State, we're shooting 65% from two. Uh, against Coastal Carolina, 55%. Uh, against Houston Christian, 76%. That's pretty good. Yeah. So, and then you fast forward to the Kansas game, Missouri shoots 56, or sorry, sorry, 46% from two. And then against UCF, 
48 percent from two big difference competition matters yeah yeah for sure um did it feel like missouri played better defense in this game it's hard to say because the because possessions yeah. were so low. I mean, I like seeing UCF only score 66 points, mm -hmm. but slower tempo, yeah, I, I guess it looked it looked somewhat better. It felt like the um, I mean, the perimeter defense is, is still suspect, but it felt like there weren't as many just like terrible breakdowns like we saw against Kansas, um, just like literally players giving up because they're so far out of position and stuff. We, there was none of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To Mizzou's credit, UCF only shot – 36 percent from two mm -hmm. they were so playing, they only had nine makes yeah they were playing a little man in zone kind of switching it up throughout the game yeah overall like missouri did what they had to do to win the game or just to be right there in it at the end i would have liked to see after that 18 to 1 run them just kind of put it away mm -hmm. but when you don't play great defense it's not gonna happen yeah uh, yeah that's that's you know in the Conzo era, it was kind of like, well, we're just going to muddy things up and we're never going to be out of games probably. Um, right. But, and this is the opposite where it's like, we might get up to a 15 point lead and lose because we just don't know how to slow it down and we don't know how to play defense. So yeah. just totally opposite. So Mizzou is 10 and one now, uh, one more non-conference game. Well, we got Iowa state later in the season, but, uh, one more non-conference game before sec play starts. And that is against Illinois on Thursday, the bragging rights game in St. Louis. Illinois is pretty good. I hate to uh, hate to tell everybody. Uh, number twenty-one in Kim Palm, forty-fourth on offense, eighteenth on defense. They did lose from last year's team: Kofi Coburn, Andre Carbello, and Trent Frazier. Coburn Jeff. playing professionally in Japan. Hmm. Uh, Carbello as playing for mike anderson at st john's and yeah, pretty good season yeah, yeah yeah they were one of the last undefeated teams oh okay uh and trent frazier finally graduated he's 40 years old yeah. <laughs> but they replaced those guys with uh texas tech transfer terrence shannon and uh baylor transfer matthew mayer he started all 30 games on baylor's championship season two yeah. years ago yeah and then they bring in a true freshman a four-star recruit uh, guard Sky Clark, so they've reloaded. Um, Man, I mean, Mayor, I, I, this got to be one of the biggest transfers in college basketball. I, I mean, that's just a massive addition for Illinois, considering they needed to reload. Yeah, and he is—he's playing really well. Yeah, and they've got a, a couple other guys in their starting lineup that have just been been there for a, a few years and have grown into the system. Uh, Coleman Hawkins is a junior who was backing up. Uh, Coburn the last couple years and he is uh, basically a true stretch five he's made 12 threes on the season and he can move pretty well mm -hmm. a good rebounder good offensive rebounder um, good passer out of the post so yeah that's I think that's what scares me the most about Illinois is like all five guys on the on the floor are just constantly moving around it's a very fluid offense they can all shoot yeah they're all around you know all capable on the perimeter so and Mayer is such a frustrating player to play against. He's just so crafty and a great shooter. And it's just there's no way to consistently beat him, I feel like. So I have a feeling he's going to be a frustrating player to play against in this game. He's just a really good college basketball player. Yeah, they've got six players on their team who have – six guys have made 12 or more threes on the season. So they, And they don't have anybody shooting over 40%, but – like all six of those guys are in that 34 to 39 percent range so yeah it's i mean with mizzou's perimeter defense this could be a recipe for a disaster yeah and um can't or uh kansas uh i'm foreshadowing here because i feel like <laughs> it's going to be a similar outcome to the kansas game but be. uh Illinois this is who we're playing and they have good size inside like uh Mayer as much of an offensive threat as he is he's still six nine long who, who can defend multiple positions uh Hawkins who I who I mentioned can move around on defense honestly he's six ten, a really huge guy but he can switch and 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 move with guards to some extent I think uh Illinois defense is going to give Missouri fits mm -hmm. and I and uh, 
Yeah, it's like they Illinois has kind of had the like the star power approach in the last few years. You know, they've had uh, Coburn and who is Mu. Dis- yes, yeah. and just these like NBA caliber, you know, professional players where they kind of really rely on on one or two of those those stars to power them through. But I feel like this team might be as balanced as they've had in, in you know the last three to five years. So just like no clear star that's dominating but they you know they have five or five to seven guys who are just excellent yeah they uh and they've they played a pretty tough schedule so far this year they are they're eight and three uh big wins over ucla and texas yeah number uh, two in the country texas yeah um and but they did lose to virginia maryland and penn state but those are all uh, Penn State's the worst ranked team there at, at 34. I think that was a home game for Illinois too. Wasn't yes, it? that's kind of a bizarre loss. Yeah. but yeah. early uh, early conference game there, December 10th. Yeah. Other, other than that game though, they've basically every game they have destroyed the op- the opponent or um, been really really close in a loss. Yeah, I'm trying to find uh, like they held Syracuse to 44 points. I watched some of that game. That's unbelievable. Syracuse actually, I'm pretty sure, started off winning in that game too, and Illinois just closed the game on like a 50 to 10 run or something. So I'm trying to think of any way Missouri wins this game, and if they were going to win, it would look like the UCF game basically, but with more turnovers from Illinois. Like that's we gotta be turning these teams over, and that was something that. Like, you think back to Mizzou teams of old, like Mike Anderson, fastest 40 minutes Mizzou teams, they were turning over the best teams in the country at, at a rate that allowed them to play differently than anybody else. And Missouri was doing that most of the year so far against really bad teams, and now we've hit better competition, and these teams just aren't turning the ball over. Mm-hmm. And it's not leading to those runouts. And so, but that can change. That's, that's something that once you get used to this level of competition, you can find ways to turn these teams over, Mm. but it's got to start soon because there's no more cupcakes left. Yeah. There's, there's really no chance Missouri wins this game if they're not able to to create some havoc and and create some turnovers and points and transition from that. Um, You know, it could be a little bit of a different environment for both teams. Again, you know, I think the environment's going to come into play Mm -hmm. in the neutral court environment in St. Louis. Um, I think, honestly, I just think Illinois is going to have open threes all night. So I think we, this is like a terrible, this is like a sucky way to explain strategy. But I just, I think you got to hope Illinois just isn't shooting well because (laughs) otherwise it's not going to go well. Yeah, if Illinois is cold and, and I think they will... It's not going to be like the Kansas game where, like, with Kansas just making everything. I think Illinois will be more streaky, and I think we'll be able to turn them over enough to stay in the game. I don't think they're just going to shoot us out, and but I really think Missouri's going to struggle to score the ball. Yeah. Well, historically, uh, Bragg and Wright's games are pretty close, even when it feels like they shouldn't be, so I guess you never know. No Javon Pickett, though. True. Um, we if we could borrow him for one game from St. Louis, that'd be really nice. That's true. Um, I think. Oh, I think Missouri is going to have to be hot from three. Will they be able to do it two games in a row? I don't think so. Not as well as they did it against UCF, at least. And I think they'll struggle from two, like they have been. Hopefully, they figure something out there. But I've got. Illinois winning this game 80 to 72. Yeah, I agree. I think Missouri's going to struggle on the inside again. Going to have to shoot as well as they did against UCF. It's going to be tough to guard all five players of Illinois who are capable at all spots in the floor. I think Missouri loses 85 to 70. Ooh, that's. Ooh. I'm not feeling this one. Illinois pulling away at the end. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Well, I hope it's a little closer than that. I hope uh, they can give us, you know, moments in the second half where it looks like they're in this thing. But, yeah, if, uh, we're going to need Illinois to not shoot very well from three, I'm afraid. And if we can almost just uh, say the exact same thing all over again for Kentucky. 
because that's who we play next. Uh, first game of SEC play. Kentucky is 7-3 and three on the season with losses to number 38, Michigan State, number 9, Gonzaga, and UCLA. Uh, they have pretty good wins over Michigan and Yale. Um, Missouri would be... Uh, is probably worse than... Uh, well, Kim Palm ranking Missouri is worse than Michigan, but better than Yale, so... Um, who knows? There's still a chance there. It is at home for Missouri, uh, but Kentucky, in a similar way to Illinois, lost a few guys but then reloaded with everything they need to be successful this year. Obviously, they bring back Oscar Shibwe and Severe Wheeler, and we were, men- we were talking about a little bit before we started recording. Like, Of course, Kentucky ends up with these two guys that are just perfect college basketball players. A big man who doesn't stretch the floor so he's not going to be you know he's only six only six nine and doesn't stretch the floor so he's not going to be pulled away to the nba immediately and an undersized guard who gets steals and sets up his teammates at a prolific level he's not going to go to the nba because he's too small yeah it's so like anti-kentucky of like the early 2010s era where it was just like all nba players um it feels like they've kind of have found that perfect formula of like pros but also just good college basketball players that are have longer careers and aren't those you know obvious one and done type players. Yeah, and then they fill out their roster a little bit with uh, Illinois State transfer Antonio Reeves. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've watched him play a few times. Yeah, excellent shooter. Was one of the top transfers this past off season, and he is shooting 45 percent from three and uh, takes a lot of shots, but they're, they're really well balanced. Uh, Jacob Toppin is a, four, a forward who uh, has good size, can switch defensively. Not, not a three-point shooter, but um, you know, just does the little things right, plays good defense. And then uh, they have a true freshman, Kaysen Wallace, who was the number 10 player in his class, uh, who is a guard. And he's shooting 45% from three as well. So like, mm-hmm. it is so similar to we, we are seeing the blueprint for success with oh, yeah. how Kansas, Illinois, and Kentucky have constructed their rosters with these four-year guys who aren't going anywhere and can develop the system yeah. and then grab a timely transfer who can make baskets and sprinkle in a five-star freshman here and there. Yeah. You'll have a basically Final Four quality team. Yeah, perfect mix of experience and talent. Um, and, you know, it's... It seems like there was a few years where Kentucky maybe wasn't on the, the transfer trend yet and or maybe just weren't maximizing it yet. But it seemed like there was uh, they just had a bunch of freshmen who were, you know, long arms and, you know, kind of NBA type prospects, but nobody could shoot. Yeah. <laughs> and so they kind of struggled on offense for for maybe a, a two or three year stretch there. Um, but now that they've kind of teams have figured out how to maximize the transfer portal you just go get an experienced guard who can shoot get a couple of those guys which is exactly what anthony reeves is kind of completes the picture and gives them a completely new dimension on offense it just changes everything yeah reeves is really good yeah and like he could he could well he did this at illinois state but he could have gone to other schools and been featured more in the offense i think and Mm -hmm. be like borderline leading the country in scoring yeah but he's just kind of playing his role yeah. at Kentucky, making shots, uh, moving the ball around the offense. Yeah, he's kind of just that really productive player at a mid-major level. He kind of done what we kind of hoped and expected maybe Isaiah Mosley was going to do. Yeah. Still time. Um, trying to figure out how Missouri can be competitive here with Kentucky. Kentucky does have the sixth best defense according to the efficiency metrics on Kempom, number six in the country there. Uh, average tempo, so, but they can, they've, they're athletic enough. They can play however you want to play and still beat you. Um, the only thing is they're 211th in the country in two point, uh, percentage offense. So if we can, but it seems like with their size, they ought to be able to take advantage of Missouri there, but yeah, it really does feel like, uh, their strengths are our weaknesses. And I, I even remember before we had seen a single second of this Missouri team play in the preseason, I just circled this Kentucky game as probably one of the least likely wins, even though it is at home. 
but just because of the way their roster is constructed and that just absolute anchor of that is Oscar Shibwe. I mean, he's going to go for 2020 in this game like easily if he wants to, I think. Unless we get him in foul trouble. Yeah, that's true. And I just think he's going to get anything he wants on the inside and, and rebound every ball that, that comes near him. And just because of the way Missouri is a little bit anemic on the inside, I think he's just going to have an incredible game. And, you know, now that they have kind of ad- added shooting, it does feel like, well, if for whatever reason that's not working, you know, we'll, t- we'll exploit this perimeter defense. Yeah. Yep. And, of course, they're very well coached as well. Um Mm. But I don't know that it's some blowout either. You know, I, I could envision Illinois blowing us out, um, and I've kind of predicted that. But honestly, I think this Kentucky game is – it's almost like more certain of a loss, but it could be closer and lower scoring. Yeah, I'm thinking lower, sco- lower scoring as well. Um, I'm going to say Kentucky wins this game something like 74 to 68. Yeah, give me Kentucky 70 to 61. Ooh. Yeah, it's funny how uh, Missouri was averaging 91 points per game or something for like the first eight games and then score 67 in a loss to Kansas and 68 in a win against UCF. Yeah. Man, it's like a... Whole new sport. Yeah, it reminds me of like a whatever year Josh Heupel's offense for the football team would just like put up 50 points on every bad team, but then just, yeah. I mean, I hate to to say it, but it almost just kind of felt like cheating a little bit where you could just (laughs) take the ball away from these poor, you know, lower level D one kids and just run down the court and just outlet pass every, you know, it just kind of felt like Missouri was almost cheating. They were just exploiting these bad matchups like exactly like Josh Heupel had Drew Locke to just throw five touchdowns on every bad team they played and then against decent competition it was like oh, okay we gotta we gotta actually do something we gotta do something here do a little different can't just out athlete people anymore yeah and I still think Missouri's defense can cause turnovers if they you know they are kind of playing this hectic style of defense that can uh, give teams trouble but we haven't seen it against a good team yet. So until we see that, like we got to see something there before we can be confident that that'll come back. Uh, I don't know that it happens right now. But but at the same time, you'll take those two wins over Wichita State and UCF. Absolutely. Like, I just I am absolutely thrilled that we're sitting here at 10 and 1 at this juncture in the season. Yeah, most of the time, you get 10 wins in your non-conference slate then you know you put yourself in a position to if you can get 10 wins in sec play you're on the ncaa tournament bubble yeah and there was a pretty good chance just looking at this gauntlet that you know they could have easily lost like five straight games here because they had kansas ucf you know illinois kentucky and then i think that who do they have arkansas Arkansas after that so this very well could have been a five game losing streak if they didn't pull out that game against ucf and you know, maybe you grab one out of that that three game stretch of Illinois, Kentucky, Arkansas, and you'll be really happy with that. I think very happy. Yes. Um. Anything else basketball related before we move on to this bowl game? I don't think so. When was the last time Missouri won a bowl game? I think Minnesota in two thousand fourteen. That's terrible. Um, <laughs> Missouri has an opportunity here in the Gasparilla Bowl against Wake Forest. You know, let's talk about Wake Forest a little bit. Wake Forest in the ACC, uh, seven and five on the season, three and five in ACC play. Uh, quarterback Sam Hartman, pretty good, threw for thirty four hundred yards, thirty five touchdowns, and eleven interceptions. Uh, they have two running backs who share the backfield. One of those is transferring though. Christian Turner no longer on the team, so that leaves Justice Ellison. Um, the two players combined for 1,100 yards and 12 touchdowns. So we'll see if he can shoulder the load on his own. And they have five wide receivers with over 500 yards receiving on the team or on the season. And leading them is a 6'5 junior, A.T. Perry, 70 catches, 980 yards, and 11 touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, the theme with Wake Forest here is just stats everywhere. Like, every meaningful player on their team has just put up, like, gaudy stats this season. Um, They do everything well. It's hard to 
stop anything because everything works and if you watch a couple of different games of wake forest it's like a different wide receiver is going for two touchdowns or something it's just a different guy every game so they're incredibly difficult to to contain on offense yeah they do uh, a lot of rpos Mm -hmm. uh you'll see the quarterback holding the holding onto the ball like looking down the field oh yeah during the handoff process like almost every play yeah he's really great at that just kind of seeing what's out there and making a decision on the fly yeah and hopefully missouri's defensive line can get some pressure in there and make that more stressful than he's used to Mm -hmm. um that would be huge that would go a long way to missouri winning this game but they just look wake forest on offense looks very under control poised and just taking they when you talk about taking what the defense gives you that is their whole game plan basically yeah, very calculated I, it doesn't look like a big guy their quarterback i don't think Mm-mm. he's 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 big or even super athletic or anything but he's just a really smart player puts the ball exactly where it needs to be he's just a very accurate passer yeah he has those really good stats and i believe he missed uh the first game of the season mm. so it could have been a little bit better for him stat wise um they did play vanderbilt in week two they won that game 45 to 25 they started their season off really hot and did kind of cool off down the stretch a little bit that could have just been competition i'm not sure but yeah they were six and one at one point they did have a nice win over florida state uh played clemson lost to clemson 51 to 45 yeah a lot of high scoring games i mean Missouri's offense is going to have opportunities. Uh, this, you know, the the defense is pretty porous, and this should be a little bit of back and forth. And I just, I don't really expect either defense to look super prolific in this game. <laughs> yeah, Wake Forest offense was first in the ACC with uh, just under thirty seven points per game, and but their defense was twelfth in the ACC, giving up twenty nine points per game and 13th in passing yards allowed per game so are they in shootouts because their offense is good or because their defense is bad i think it's a little bit of both i think teams are throwing on them because they're down but also that's it's just working a little bit Mm -hmm. so yeah should be an opportunity for missouri's offense um talking about this missouri team obviously we've lost some players to the transfer portal we've lost some players who uh, have declared for the draft but uh it seems like it's now a blanket waiver the ncaa has come down and said you can play in a bowl game and it won't count against your eligibility have have they yeah i know that missouri had to um like apply for a waiver i'm pretty sure that was um you know approved for dj weselak and who's the other one uh jamarian wayne Wayne. so because i think both those guys had played in it exactly four games and were like right there at the cutoff and so missouri obviously wanted to Preserve the red shirt there if they could, and it sounds like that'll that'll be able to happen. Yeah, I think uh, I think I did see something where it's like uh, after this news came out about you know getting the waiver for these two, I think the NCAA has basically just said, "Cool, yeah, you can play in the bowl game." Remember, like, there's even like 2023 20, recruits that are be- eligible, like early enrollees that are eligible or something. I do feel like it's just been like this, uh, like the dam has broke yeah. and on stuff like that. Like yeah. obviously NIL and the NCAA is just like, yeah, do whatever you want now. Yeah, like every day you hear about a player who's getting like their seventh or eighth or ninth, ninth. year of eligibility. Yes. It, most of that's due to injury or whatever, but. Yeah, they're like, yeah, seemed, we don't care anymore. Yeah, just play. Play. Yeah. Just, yeah, just do what you want. You're going to have guys like play a season in the NFL and they're like, this, I want to go back to college. I'm like, yeah, well, here's a waiver. It's fine. <laughs> Somebody will make it. Somebody will make it make sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering though, how? What are we going to see in the bowl game now with some departures from Mizzou's roster? Are they going to look much different from what we saw all season? Sometimes it feels like Mizzou teams lately. When we go to a bowl, it's like completely disjointed from right. the regular season. Yeah. Last year we had a different quarterback. That's and, true. So I'm assuming Brady Cook's going to play 100% of this game. I'm assuming Missouri, you know, it, it just depends on what they want. You know, I think they could come into this game and look at it as a way to get their younger players more experience, which maybe they probably will. If that's Sam Horn or not, prob- it probably won't be. If they're just coming in to win, then, yeah, Brady Cook's going to play 100% of this game. They're, it probably is going to look pretty similar to what they did in the season and you know the good thing about the transfer portal so far is obviously we've lost dominic lovett but for the most part 
um, and, and with the NFL stuff, you know, we, we have kind of maintained uh, most of our personnel of our of our starters and um, in our in our depth. So most of the guys that have left, I feel like are players that weren't really seeing the field for them um, outside of love it. So, yeah, um, I think I think Missouri's going to look pretty similar. The, the, the defensive line might be the one thing that looks a little bit different with no Isaiah McGuire or DJ Coleman. So yeah. that's probably my biggest concern. Yeah, and I could see Wake Forest offense being able to take advantage of, you know, younger guys playing there. And, and if Missouri's defensive line just can't get pressure, then watch out. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen some, like, interesting stuff in, in bowl games the past couple of years. You know, Florida played a bowl game last night. They looked awful. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, they were not trying. They lost 30-3 to against Oregon State. And in some ways, I kind of understand. You mm-hmm. know, your quarterback is gone for the NFL. Transfer stuff's going on. You've, it, you've only got six wins. The bowl game doesn't matter. Yeah. It's just a meaningless bowl situation. But, I mean, there's there's film of, of dudes just straight up not trying in that game. Um, I don't think we're going to see any of that in this bowl game with Mizzou and Wake Forest. I definitely think there's some intangibles at play, especially from the Wake Forest side. You know, they've they've pretty much everybody on their team is, is – that, that they had in the regular season is going to be playing. Um, they want to beat the big boy and they, they want to beat the SEC team. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely think that Wake Forest is going to want to win this game. And, you know, Brady Cook is, is wanting to keep his job. So I definitely think there's some intangibles at play that are going to, you know, motivate both teams. Yeah. Wake Forest last year played in the ACC championship game. Yeah. And now they're having a, they could go for their eighth win here in this bowl game. So they've got some momentum in their program that, they they're de- they are definitely interested in winning this game, mm-hmm. and I feel like for Coach Drink and Mizzou, at some point, you know, however meaningless the bowl game is, really, at some point you want some bowl wins on your resume as a head coach, because that kind of just shows you know we can go do something in the postseason. Yeah, and and Drinkwitz uses those things. You know, yeah. I've I've heard him in interviews say like yep we've done this we did this we you know got the best class in history we you know beat the defending national champions in lsu like he will use those things to sell himself and sell the program so this is one of those things where you be like yep we 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 got over the hump got that bowl win and that's just gonna you know that's all part of the program momentum even if that's you know an intangible thing that you know materially doesn't really mean anything it all adds up to just the vibes around the program basically Mm -hmm. yeah yeah you want to finish the season on a a strong note too um i I guess we might have some more uh, i want to talk about transfer portal just a little bit more but let's give our official predictions for the bowl game i'm kind of hoping i'm kind of excited for a little bit of a shootout yeah i think i think you'll get that uh, I'm definitely feeling a Mizzou win. I think Missouri's defense steps up and doesn't let Wake Forest go crazy. So I think Mizzou wins the game. Oof, I'm struggling here. I'm thinking something like 30 to 27 Mizzou wins. It could be higher scoring than that. I though. think we'll see a little more points than that. I am a little bit worried about Missouri's defensive line and just the defense in general against Wake Forest offense. I think this is genuinely a, a great offense. Uh, and of course, um, what's Missouri going to do without their without Bush Hamden? You know, I think he was kind of starting to influence the play calling, and it was you know, things were going well. Uh, no Dominic Lovett. I unfortunately think Wake Forest has a little bit more to play for in this game. I think they're going to pull it out. I think they win 41-34. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I think my score was a little too low. I'm, I'm adjusting a little bit. Still got Mizzou win. I'm going 34-31. to 31. Three-point game. I like yours better. Yeah, I'm worried if, uh, if, if this game's being played in the 40s, I feel like Missouri loses. Yeah, no Dominic Lovett. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, it'd be nice to get a little glimpse of the future with uh, Luther Burden being the number one uh, wide receiver. Mm. And Theo Weiss play? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be nice. Uh, either way, that will be a fun matchup. Uh, two teams that have never played before. Yeah. Never played each other crazy. before. Pretty fun. 
Um, transfer portal. This won't take very long. Missouri, not a lot of news for Missouri specifically since we last talked, but I did want to bring up the fact that SEC teams ranked as far as players that have entered the transfer portal. Texas A&M is on top. They don't want to be on top of this list, but they're there with 25 players who have entered the transfer portal. Florida, 19, Arkansas, 18, Mississippi, 18, Alabama, 15, LSU, 13, Mississippi State, 12, Vanderbilt, 12, Kentucky, 10, Auburn, 10, Missouri, 9, South Carolina, 9, Tennessee, 7, Georgia, 1. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Texas A&M with 25 and Georgia with 1. I guess Georgia's season is still... Yeah going Tennessee still too they're, yeah. they're both playing in very meaningful bowl games and yeah, we could play see off. yeah and with uh you know uh Texas A&M not yeah. playing in a bowl game it's yeah. like yeah everybody's gonna announce God, but. what an absolute cesspool cluster that is Texas A&M and you know, there's got to be some kind of correlation between maybe high amounts of NIL or maybe wide ranges because I think it's like Texas A&M players are getting paid a lot probably for NIL, but like a lot of them across the board probably are. Yeah. I wonder if there's some correlation between like the NIL distribution and like the transfers on, you know, a year later. That that's possible. I'd say there's a pretty big correlation between only winning five games and having 25 players transfer out. But, uh, especially, I mean, it goes hand in hand. It's like, the reason all this NIL money is being thrown around at a place like Texas A&M is because they expect to be, you know, winning 10 games and every year and being right there in the sec championship conversation. So that's, what's causing this influx of cash into the program. And then when it just, you have an awful season where all of that turns into five wins, yeah, then it's just like abandoned ship. Everybody get out of here. Yeah. I think, uh, obviously we're, I'm sure we're going to see some kind of regulations come to NIL. We're going to see some changes made, which is probably for the best. But one thing that might force things to change is when donors are coughing up money and it doesn't translate and they feel like they're getting burned. Yeah. I feel like that might be something that's happened here a little bit. And maybe it would need to happen year after year after year for, for donors to stop doing something like that. If they have so much money, it doesn't matter. But yeah, they got to be wondering, like, what kind of return am I getting on my investment here when it, Texas A&M <laughs> wins five games? I could see that. I could also see it just – they just don't care. And, like, you know, they were – I could see a good chunk of this NIL money at a place like Texas A&M. It, a lot of it's going to be new money, but some of it's just going to be moved around a little bit. Yeah, I was already putting all this money toward – I was already donating X amount of dollars to Texas A&M. And now I'm taking a chunk of that and putting it towards the players directly through this NIL collective. So I don't know. I think it'll... Money's not stopping. Yeah. And I think it'll result in like a shorter leash for coaches earlier than it will like bring about big change with NIL. And maybe those come hand in hand, but... Gonna have to start a uh, Jimbo Fisher buyout fund. Yeah, exactly. Of NIL here pretty exactly. soon. Exactly. Yeah. But I just wanted to mention that obviously uh, it's a long off season where a lot can change. We haven't played our bowl game yet. And, uh, but overall, I feel like Mizzou hasn't done too bad as yeah. far as, um, the core staying together, mm-hmm. obviously getting our two star defensive backs returning. Um, and it hasn't announced yet, but it seems like it's going that way. Yeah. <laughs> I got, I got to remember that's not official, but He's it's already a, just put it in your mind. It's, it's official like, in my like, head. Oh, yes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> he did say an announcement was coming soon. I, I do expect that he'll, he'll return, but, and also Avery Helm was the cornerback. We, we mentioned last episode that it seemed like things were trending well for Missouri. He actually committed to TCU. I wonder if that's connected to mm. Chris Abrams strain and Ennis Rake straw potentially returning. Don't even need him. Don't even need him. We don't want him. He's, he wasn't good enough anyway, right? Exactly. We, he wasn't going to play here. He's Yeah, he'll just play for the college football playoff <laughs> team, TCU. <laughs> exactly. Um, overall, though, yeah. don't panic. Like, love it. Going to be a, 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 a loss that hurts to some extent. But we've got a good receiving core. We've covered it up with a big-time transfer already. So I feel like Missouri's sitting okay yeah. as far as keeping the core together. 
a core that only won six games, but yeah, I mean, really, you're, you you've lost one impact player to the transfer portal. Your other two impact players that you've that you've lost are have gone to the NFL or are I mean, I don't know if DJ Coleman had another year of eligibility. I guess it sounds like maybe he did, but you know, that's the kind of players that's that's the kind of losses you do want to see are the are the players that are good enough to move on and and definitely Isaiah McGuire will will be playing on Sundays, but. Uh, you know, for the most part, I agree. Missouri's held on to the core of their team. It speaks well to the uh, culture and the locker room and and uh, how things are going. I, I I definitely think if things were not going well, we we would know. And I think Missouri has put, you know, assuming we don't have any more you know key losses, I think we've really put ourselves in a good position to to have a, a net positive uh, transfer portal off season. Definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, like I said, the earliest. Um getting that wide receiver spot filled with uh Weiss when we didn't when we were still that was still going to be a strength regardless not the strength that was this year necessarily but I was still feeling okay about the wide receiver room before that addition so I I think we're totally fine there yeah I did find it interesting that it was reported on the Georgia Rivals site that Dominic Lovett was on campus in Athens yeah a couple days ago i think i saw i don't know where i read this but it was somewhere on twitter Uh, he had like a highlight video that was made Mm. and i think i saw that the the brand that made that highlight video like strictly works with georgia stuff and so very cool it just yeah it seems like there's been some pretty strong ties to to georgia and then of course he's been on he's been on campus there it looks like that may be where he's headed no not georgia seriously (laughs) but Uh, i mean whenever you leave an sec school where are you gonna go like yeah. if you're transferring up from a place like Missouri, there's not that many places you're going to go. And it just isn't that surprising to me that he's going to go to Georgia or Alabama or something like that. Yeah. Just uh, go to the big 10, go to TCU, go to USC, go someplace far away. Not going to happen. No. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there's a little, uh, transfer portal roundup there. Um, I hope the hope the basketball team can find something against these better teams. Yeah. Need to look good some way. And uh should be a fun Gasparilla Bowl. Are you gassed up for the Gasparilla Bowl? I'm so gassed. Wow. Um, but you think they're gonna lose. I do. Okay. But I'm still excited. I mean I'm I'm excited just to watch my team play sports, Cam. That's how it works. The oh, yeah. whole the whole football season, I'm just hoping for a bowl game because I just want one more opportunity to watch a football game. Yeah, uh, at this time of year, every year, I go. What happened to the football season? It just flies. It by. just is gone. Yeah, it's too short. College football season is w- really short, and now we get this like two month long break before the national championship game. Yeah, seriously. All right. Well, is that it for this week? I think so. You got anything you need to say? You would do in a moment. Special thank you to our Patreon supporters at the $10 level and above. Britt Treese, Brian Smith, Ryan Demore, Tristan, Ben Smith, Parker, Daddy JD, Lewis Hernandez, Tim Keens, Tyler Harsel, Brandon Groffalo, Brandon Hanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, and happy holidays. You can find this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. We're on Twitter at Missouri Sports Pod, and you can email us at Missouri Sports Pod at gmail.com. You can find our t shirts and stickers on our online shop, Missouri Sports Pod.bigcartel.com. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thanks for listening. We will see you next year.